Hey guys, what's up? Happy New Year 2020. And uh, this video, what I want to do is address a few things from uh, like basically some videos I've done over the past couple months. And the first one is the popular video where I was talking about ditching React. Uh, I also had a video, I think, ditching Stack Overflow. And uh, both of those videos, I would say, are rant. So um, of the you know six and a half years or, or so that I've been doing YouTube, I, I, I do rants every now and then just... Uh, you know, whatever sort of frame of mind I'm in, I'll do a video. And um, some, some of these videos, I don't expect to get so many views. And, and with the React one, it got a lot of views. And um, some people are like, okay, if I'm talking about using React now, if I talked about ditching it a few months ago, why would I say that? Like, uh, what would be my motivation for that? Am I being paid by Facebook? And the only thing I can say to that is I wish I was, but Facebook, uh, they don't care about Chris Hawks and they're not going to be paying me to, um, to show their products out there. So the reason why um, I actually was talking about ditching React, and I, I think for me it was it was just really it was about burnout. So in this field, um, you can be burned out from time to time, and I think it's kind of a normal thing. You do the same thing over and over again for five years, which is what I've been doing with React development. And React, you know, rewrites their stuff, and you have to kind of relearn the new architecture. And even if um, you know the, the relearning isn't a big deal especially if you've been doing React for a long time. If you go from the old way of doing React, like I, I was doing React when we used to have an actual in-browser JSX transpiler that we would include into our project. And you only use that during development, and then you would take that out. So uh, from there, though, we ended up, we started using tools, and I remember it went over to Babel. So I had to learn about Babel and how to get all that set up with React. So um, that was a little bit of a learning curve, and we started using these, um, you know, these, these compilers to then write all the React code and minify it, put it into a file. And it was a new way of learning, and that's not the way that like, React was originally um, teaching it when it first came out. So then you start getting used to that, and then React changes its component model to start using ES6 classes. And the entire architecture of React changes to use ES6 classes. Now, naturally, all the other li libraries and everything out there were doing the same thing, because they're moving over to TypeScript, they want interfaces, classes, all this stuff. So then you have to learn the class-based architecture, and React has a bunch of life, uh, life cycle hooks and everything that you, uh, and that's not even talking about the hooks for a second, but th there is, that's what they were. They're, they're, they're life cycle, so you have things like before the component mounts, after it mounts, just before it updates, after it updates, all this different stuff. And then we move from the class-based system to a more functional approach. And it's like, hey, we don't need any of that stuff for a lot of these components. So if you don't need it for a lot of these components, go ahead and use this functional approach um, where you just pass in your props to the, the functional component and you don't need classes and you don't have to bind your click events and all this other stuff. Um, and that was the recommended approach, especially if the component didn't have to maintain its own state. So then you're like, okay, well, now I have to kind of start factoring in, okay, what should be functional versus what should be uh, a state-based class component? So you have to learn about that. And then after we start doing that, like we start to look into, okay, well, there's not even any sort of uh, performance benefit. So when they first started doing functional components, there was no performance benefit for using that over a class-based one. So the real question was, why would we rewrite the architecture and rewrite our components if we weren't getting uh, an actual performance boots, boost, but eventually React updated their components and their library, and you started getting uh, getting an actual uh, performance boost by using functional components. So we start getting used to that, and then React does away with pretty much the entire lifecycle methods, and they just basically say, okay, use hooks now. So this is like over just a short period of time of a few years where it's just constantly changing, and the whole point behind that is like, React is a good project, and it's a good template engine. It's probably the best template engine out there, I think. But having to relearn the same thing over and over again for five years, and every time you change that, of course, like there's going to be code that, that gets changed along the way. So if you have an entire library of React components, and some of them are using classes, some of them are functional, some are using hooks, you have this big mix, mix mash, and I was just like, this stuff sucks. I'm tired of, I'm tired of you know rewriting this crap every six months because you know, React finds some new way of doing something or they're trying to compete with Vue or Angular or something like that. And it's just the nature of web development. This stuff changes with the wind. And we have to worry about, we have to watch out for burnout. I think that's probably the main thing behind all this stuff is that you can get burned out from that stuff because 
you're like, I, I'd rather be learning about AR or VR or like having, you know, maybe doing some machine learning in my web development, um, maybe doing some games, you know, using WebGL or something. But instead, I'm rewriting the same component architecture over and over again for React to, to keep up with the latest documentation. So why do we have to keep up with the latest documentation? It's because when you have new developers coming in and all they know is either the class-based system or they know the functional-based stuff, or you have, like in this case, the documentation is still using classes, but do you use hooks? And why use classes instead of the functional components and all that stuff? It makes training new developers that come into the code base a lot more difficult. And it also makes it more hard um, to maintain your actual um, you know, your, your, your actual code base because you have so many different ways of doing the same thing. And my entire point behind that was just like, if they keep changing this crap and not making it better overall, but just changing the way that we keep doing it and, and to, to achieve the same result, it's kind of like, like, in, it's kind of like insanity a little bit, but all that said, the reason why you want to use react JS is because the jobs, right? So I've been I've been paid for the last five years, not by Facebook, but by React JavaScript jobs. And like, if we look at Indeed, and you look at you know the amount of React jobs right now. So if I say React JS, you got six thousand seven hundred thirty-one jobs available right now in the United States. Um, if I just say React, you have fifty-six thousand. So that's a little bit um, high. That there's not that many jobs. But the thing is, is React now leads over Angular. It leads over Vue. And ultimately, when you're talking about what is the best language to learn, there is no best language for anything, really. I mean, we like to talk about it on the web because it gets a lot of views on YouTube and everything, but there's no best language. And every language, every library is really a tool. So the, the, the question you have to ask yourself is, like, what am I building? And um, if you were looking at it as, like, a blue-collar approach, like, there's going to be certain tools that allow you to build, uh, do carpentry, uh, that it will save you time on, on like, a, like as a carpenter's job, right? You're building a house, you're framing up a house. There are certain tools available for that, and they shine over other tools. So you could probably cut your wood with some sort of blowtorch that you're actually using for welding or soldering pipes or something like that, but it's not the right tool for the job for carpentry. So the same thing kind of goes with programming. Python is a great tool for machine learning. It's a great tool for all around systems level programming where like you're reading directories of files, you're iterating over those files, you're looking for certain text, you're replacing things, and you're writing new files. It's great for that type of thing. Python's not great for writing games though. So you could build games in Python, but why would you do that if you're really trying to be serious about um, building a game? Because if you were really serious about building a game, you're probably gonna try to use a better tool, which is really, this is like an entire framework library, which is built off of C and C++, which is faster than Python. But Python is just C, right? So Python's gonna save you time on syntax for doing systems level programming. You're not gonna use Unity and C Sharp for systems level programming, but if you wanna build video games, there's probably no better tool, especially for a beginner. If your goal was to try to do machine learning, then you're going to be looking at Python because Python shines there. That It's a better tool than ML.NET using C Sharp or uh, Java's machine learning libraries. If you're trying to build mobile apps, you can use the, you know, just the standard SDK from uh, for the Java SDK for Android, which is probably the best way to write native apps. But the problem is with that is if your approach was, hey, I want to build Android apps, and I also want the same app to work on iOS, then this isn't the best tool to use. So you could build the best Android apps if you understand this, uh, this toolkit, this library, the Android Studio. You'll save yourself a lot of time for an Android app, but it doesn't help you build iOS apps, right? So this isn't going to be the best tool if you wanted to have a cross-platform thing that also works on the Apple Store. So what is the best approach? Well, Mobile app development is very, very difficult, right? So there's all kinds of different ways that you can achieve the same result. But I recommend Flutter because Flutter is like the easiest way of actually getting started. It was the easiest way for me, instead of setting up these slow emulators that I have to emulate some environment, it's much better for me to be able to debug my app on my Android phone. And the same code base could also be ported over to iOS. So I'm developing you know, one code base that works for both platforms 
but there's going to be there's going to be give and take there. There's going to be certain things that don't work quite quite right. There's a lot of magic in the boxes and everything that we don't understand because we didn't actually try to build an iOS app from scratch and we didn't build an Android app from scratch. We used Flutter to do it. Some people will say, okay, you can use Flutter for web apps and all that stuff, but is that really the best option? Probably not. Like if I were going to be uh, building web-based applications, I have to first ask myself, what type of website am I even building? Static site generators are all the rage these days. Like Gatsby JS is really popular, but Gatsby under the under the hood is really just Node.js, which is a runtime library, which is great for building web apps, especially like ch like chat apps. Uh, and the reason why is it uses a synchronous architecture so that it's non-blocking. So if you have Node.js installed on your server, it's going to be more performant than Python Django. But the thing is, is like if you want to build something like the next Washington Post or you're building a blog like CNN or something like that, um, Node may not be the best option, and certainly Gatsby JS is not the best option for that. So Gatsby is really cool right now because it uses Node, it uses React, it uses GraphQL, and GraphQL is basically just a middleman but between your actual API that sits on your server and what gets sent down to the client. So it's um, you know, it's just another way of accomplishing the same thing. So. Some people will swear by Gatsby. They'll say, okay, I can use Gatsby to uh, build any sort of restaurant you know, website or something like that. If I have some basic website that is like just a pizza shop with, a, with like a menu on there, they're like, okay, well, static site generators are the best way to do it. But really, is that the case? Because honestly, like all you really need to do that, if, if, if your data was that simple, you need one tool. You need Apache. And then in addition to Apache, you need like HTML. And you could have an Apache web server running on a Linode instance that is just serving HTML. So if, you're, if your scope was drilled down that much, then I don't know why you would use a static site generator at all. And then now these static sites are like, oh, you need some dynamic content. Uh, let's go ahead and you can add these tools or you can do it this way. You can jump around and do it this way, this way, and this way to have a static site behave more dynamically. But if that were my goal, and I was trying to build CNN or something like that as a news website, I'm going to go with Django because Django has the best content management system, I think, of all web frameworks, of Ruby on Rails, of uh, ASP.NET, of uh, Java Spring, any of this stuff. Django, I think, blows all that stuff away because Django comes with this built-in administration system. It works seamlessly with databases, so you can use it with SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres. You could even use it with MongoDB if... Um, if you jump around enough hoops and everything. But then I would question that as well. I'm like, okay, if I really wanted to use MongoDB, this no SQL, no schema, I can just change my, my uh, collection of documents on the fly and like some documents can, can have like an image and some won't. And like, then I have to write a bunch of code that's actually testing to say, okay, is this thing there? Blah, blah, blah. I would use Node.js. So basically if I were going to use MongoDB for any reason, I'm going to use Node.js. I'm going to use some sort of Node.js framework. And then as far as Node is concerned, there's so many different higher level li uh, libraries on top of it because Node is, is relatively low level when it comes to web development. So if I need templates and I need um, a bunch of routing and I need to like uh, read MIME types and send back you know, CSS, JavaScript, am I returning JSON data? I'm going to use a tool that's built on top of that. So that's going to be something like Fastify. This is one of my more, uh, this is a, my favorite Node.js framework right now. I just, I like the way that they're developing this thing. Uh, and I think it, it works really well. So I have other options though. I could, I could use Express.js if I wanted to, and that's probably the most popular Node.js framework. But again, these are all just tools and libraries, and you have to ask yourself, what is it that you're building? So no matter what you're building, there's always going to be great tools that are coming up and tools get better over time. Sometimes they get deprecated, they get outdated and you have to kind of ditch them. And that's why we have videos saying, okay, we got to ditch this or like, this is better than that. But the thing is, is like, it's always about what you're building. There is no perfect language for anything. There's no perfect library for anything. It's always a matter of opinion. Lately, I've been talking about Next.js because when we talk about building websites, we need to have websites. If your website needs to be indexed by Google, you're trying to get um, what's called organic search engine traffic from Google, then you need to have server-side rendering if you're really going to succeed in that, uh, that field. And if you want server-side rendering with React and Node, 
then you probably want to use Next.js because it's the leading library out there. There might be a few other ones out there, but this seems to be the best one that I can see. And um, this just gives you the ability, like I said, to have that organic search engine traffic versus having a website that's like almost all JavaScript that has to be compiled on the client before people can actually see the data. So really the entire point is that there is no best tool for the job. Twitter was built on Rails. Uh, the e-commerce platform Shopify, where a lot of people are making money building plugins and stuff like that, that's all built on Rails. Uh, I think they have their own template engine as well. But why do they have their own template engine? Probably because the template engine built in with Rails was not, was not uh, I guess, robust enough to handle all of their requirements and everything. So they came up with their, at Shopify, they came up with their own uh, template language, and it's because it, everybody has their own idea of what they want to create and how they want to create it. There's so many different ways of achieving the same thing. You could write games in Python. Um, they're not going to be as performant as a game written in C++ or C Sharp, but you could do it. And I think, honestly, we're always going to have different opinions on what we want to do and what we want to play with. And I think one of the ways for me to, to be able to overcome burnout is simply to branch out and to continue to, you know, change my outlook by changing my results. And I do that by making goals for myself. I'm like, okay, maybe I don't like the fact that React is changing every other week or something, it seems like, but it is what it is. I'm getting paid to write it. It's a very stable language. Like if you want to get uh, a library, really, but if you want to get employment, you want to stay employed, you got to keep up with that stuff no matter how you like it or not. Like it's just part of being a programmer. And just know that like there is no perfect language. It doesn't exist. It, it, they're always different. They're always achieving the same things in many cases. And it's just a matter of opinion for the most part. If we really want to get truly low level, all this stuff is just using C. But nobody wants to use C to build something that does what Ruby on Rails does or what Django does because it would take you so much time. Nobody wants to use C for what Python does because Python saves you so much time. The time that for yourself is probably the most uh, crucial element that you have. Like you don't have all all the time in the world to keep up with every single piece of technology. So I think that when you're building your projects out, you go with what you think is the best tool, what you're most familiar with. Sometimes you might make exceptions and say, you know what? This would be more performant in C++, but I don't know C++. I don't have enough time to learn that. I do know some C Sharp. So there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I'm going to use C Sharp for gaming over C++ if you're a C Sharp developer or you find C Sharp easier to use, which I think most people would. But if you're already a C++ developer, you're clearly going to use the best tool for the job, and that's going to be C++. And you're going to interact with all these different libraries that are already out there for like graphics, loading models, all this stuff, like these pipelines and everything. Um, so go with what you're familiar with. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. And, you know, just kind of, I think, keep an open mind to the fact that certain things will come along to make things easier. And like case in point, Flutter. Like I think Flutter, even though there's no jobs, people are, there's no jobs in Flutter. Yeah, you're right. But Flutter is one of those things where you're making an investment in time hoping that something like that will pay off, that, that Flutter is going to be the way that it happens, that we build mobile apps going into the future because we've tried so many different other avenues from like Xamarin, like Cordova, all these different, like we look at like progressive web apps, all this stuff. It, like It's just, there. it's all a bunch of effort to try to achieve the same goal. So I think that if you're in the ballpark, you're using you know, remotely the right tools for the job, then you're going to be able to do carpentry if that's what you want to do. Or you can do welding and, and soldering pipes, or you can be working on HVAC systems. Or That's all kind of that blue-collar mindset of, of, uh, of you know, blue-collar construction for actual programming. But anyway, guys, um, if you guys like my content, uh, in 2020, I'm trying to grow this channel. So make sure you guys check out my newsletter. Also, if you could comment, vote up, and subscribe, I appreciate that. So I do, I do want to grow my uh, channel this year, and I need all your help as far as just even dropping a comment that helps out with the Google algorithm. And I'm going to be coming out with some tutorials this year. Uh, 2020, I feel like, is going to be a big year for me trying to teach. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and have a good day. Bye.